All right, this is The Earth and Its Peoples by Richard Bullitt. Chapter 25, Nation Building and Economic Transformation in the Americas, 1800 to 1890. We'll be looking at Section 1, Independence, Independence in Latin America. So the revolutions in Latin America were similar but also different than revolutions that we saw around the world already. You know, we talked about the American Revolution, the French Revolution, and the revolution in Haiti. And in most of these areas, there were new political and social systems that were created. Uh, much like all of these revolutions, the Enlightenment, right, all of those ideas associated with natural rights, associated with the social contract, associated with getting rid of systems of privilege, and instead putting in systems of merit, getting rid of monarchy, implementing more democratic reforms. Those are relevant in Latin America. All of these Enlightenment ideas are known there as well. Uh, however, the kind of kicking off of these revolutions are a little bit different. In the case of the American Revolution, a lot of it had to do with taxation. In the case of the French Revolution, interestingly enough, a lot of it had to do with taxation as well, the uh, states general. In Latin America, the kicking off point for these Latin American revolutions is actually what's going on in Europe, and that is Napoleon's conquest of both Spain and Portugal, happened approximately 1808 to 1809. Um, in the case of Spain, the Spanish king was forced or essentially kicked out. Um, what Napoleon did was he made his brother the king of Spain, which was a common thing that Napoleon did, was to make family members the new rulers of certain areas. In the case of Portugal, um, the king fled to Brazil, which was a Portuguese colony, and continued to rule from there. However, when the Spanish king was kicked out and Napoleon's brother was effectively the Spanish king, a group of Spaniards formed the Junta. And the Junta was kind of like a resistance movement against Napoleon. So these were Spanish who refused French rule and more or less claimed themselves as kind of like the new and true rulers of Spain. So a lot of political chaos. The question for Spain, but also Spain's colonies, recall that if we go to our map here, remember Spain had controlled pretty much all of Latin America. Um, go ahead and, and indicate where we're talking about here, right? So Spain uh, controlled Mexico at the time, controlled Central America, controlled Peru, controlled everything down here. Uh, really the only exception, oops, not Brazil, but Portugal. Uh, controlled here this territory in Brazil. So the political chaos that was caused by the Spanish king being kicked out, by this new body, the Junta, claiming that they're kind of the legitimate rulers in Spain, this led to political chaos. And you had revolutionaries or revolutionary movements break out in Venezuela, in Bolivia, in Mexico. There you had local uh, economic leaders and men of influence declaring their sovereignty from the former Spanish officials, which had traditionally been um, under the king's jurisdiction. So when we look at these various revolutionary movements, there's a, a couple of more moving pieces. But in general, we can say there are some similarities. So for the most part, these revolutionary movements were, were led by the Creole class. And the Creole class is the class of European blood. So they can trace their bloodlines back to Spain or back to Portugal, but in general they'd never actually been to the New World. These are the people who are in charge of most of the important economic and political positions in uh, the Spanish Empire or New Spain. And their goal was to eliminate the power of the peninsulares. And the peninsulares were those born, essentially born in Spain, right? So if we think about the social pyramid in uh, the Spanish colonies, again, at the very top, would have been your peninsulares. 
Uh, this one says this says peninsulas, uh, peninsular rays should be peninsular rays, right? The second kind of uh, class which had access again to things like land ownership and uh, local political positions would have been the creoles. Below that, you had a uh, the mestizo and mulatto classes. Those were people who had some European blood, right? They couldn't claim 100%, but they could at least claim some. They might have, in the case of mestizos, uh, Native American blood. In the case of mulattoes, they might have African blood. And really at the very bottom of Spanish society was the slaves. In most cases, by the 1800s, likely to be African slaves, but still uh, you know, enslaved indigenous or Native American population in that category as well. So when looking at the revolutionaries of Latin America, they are at least in many cases very top heavy, right? It is this class right here trying to overthrow the power of this class up here and kind of these classes here in some cases, you know, sort of fighting and vying for rights from the Creole class to be included. A good example of this is the case of Simone Bolivar, uh, aka the Liberator, uh, by far the most important figure in Latin American revolutions. He was very much active in the region of Colombia, right? So Simone Bolivar was very much active. Uh, let's get the right color here. Uh, in this region right here, right, Grand Colombia, where that's located. And he was somebody who was well-versed in the Enlightenment. He was European educated. He had been familiar with what people like George Washington had done and, in fact, was inspired by people like George Washington. And uh, he really took to this revolutionary cause to establish an independent right, anti-monarchy. Right? Remember, according to the Enlightenment, uh, monarchical rule is no good, right? It makes no sense for just one single person to have all the power and then for that one person to get that power by simply just being born into it. So he really wanted to create an independent anti-monarchical, right, based off Enlightenment principles, Latin American country. And uh, the case of Simone Bolivar is kind of a good example because at first, Bolivar did not want to include slaves, right? He did not want to allow slaves to be included in this revolution because many of the Creole class own slaves and that goes against their economic interests. But when realizing that slaves could be used in his military, then Bolivar became an advocate for you know, abolition. So we might say on the position of slavery, uh, first supported it, uh, but then uh, wanted it abolish. We'll say that, wanted it abolish. And that's kind of how this Creole class has to contend with the much larger population of mestizos and slaves. You know, how to utilize them to kind of achieve their goal of ousting or kicking out the peninsulares. So all across Latin America, these various factions fought one another. Patriots and loyalists were more or less what they were called. You know, patriots generally wanted an independent Latin America. Loyalists wanted it to remain part of Spain. Now, there were varying degrees of exactly what should an independent Latin American nation look like. So, for example, uh, many of the loyalists were still royalists or, or, or favored the monarchy. Uh, some of the patriots, uh, some of them were not in favor of slavery. Some of them were in favor of slavery. Some of them were in favor of just making themselves king, right? So, you know, maybe a patriot was against Spanish rule, but would have no problem with a monarchical system of government that was separate from Spain. So there's a lot of different degrees, but for the most part, patriots want independence uh, and uh, loyalists want to be connected with Spain. Simon Bolivar led the patriots and through a series of military battles did succeed by 1824 in creating Grand Colombia, which was an independent state. And uh, it was much like what perhaps the United States was, because ultimately it was Bolivar's goal to create not just an independent state, but a united independent state. But as you can see, that only lasted for so long. Uh, you know, factional rivalries were very intense in Latin America. They were intense in North America as well, but 
Um, you know, a lot of these countries were a lot younger, they were more vulnerable, and so efforts to try to break away were more successful. In 1830, Grand Colombia uh, broke apart, right? And, uh, you know, Bolivar's dream of a united Latin American state ultimately, you know, burned with that. At the same time, while Bolivar was fighting loyalist forces to gain independence in Buenos Aires, which is located in Argentina. Uh, actually, is Argentina with an E or an I? Let me check real quick. Uh, e, Argentina. I'll just rewrite it. G-E-N, Argentina. Wait, did I all, there are two I's, sorry. Just trying to get the spelling on this right. Oh, that's right, Argentina, uh, which was a city in Argentina. Uh, ranchers, landowners, government officials there declared independence as the United Provinces of Rio de la Plata. But once again, like we see in a lot of Latin American independence stories, Uruguay, Bolivia, and Paraguay broke away. From we'll just call it the U P R. DP, right? The United Provinces of Rio de la Plata. They broke away to form their own nations. And again, we would consider them to be patriots in a sense that those nations wanted to be independent from Spanish rule. But what type of government would they have? Slavery be legal? Would it be illegal? Would it be a democracy? Would it be a oligarchy? That all depended. Eventually, Jose de San Martin led, and we'll just call Argentinian. independence. Uh, he fought against uh, you know some of these various factions here. He fought against the loyalists and trying to create a united um, you know independent nation. He is also somebody that on the position of slavery initially uh, favored it but uh, sought to eliminate it when slaves could be incorporated into his revolutionary movement. did not have as much success on the battlefield, ultimately joined forces with Simone Bolivar. Uh, which, of course, secured uh, independence in 1824, hence why Bolivar is often regarded as the most important figure in these Latin American revolutions, nicknamed the Liberator. Uh, in Mexico, there was a little bit different of a circumstance there. Rather than any sort of declared independence movement, it was the conservatives, the royalists, or we might call these even loyalists, who gained control of the Mexican government. However, meanwhile, in central Mexico, there was a much more popular movement going on, right? So whereas in most other places in Latin America, we would look at the social pyramid and say, okay, uh, Latin American revolution is mostly about the Creole class against the peninsulares. In central Mexico especially, and people led by Father Hidalgo, he really organized popular support, the mestizo class, the mulatto class. These were classes of people who were heavily involved in the Catholic Church and instead sort of turned against the Creoles and the Peninsulares in trying to, um, uh, in trying to establish a more democratic government. Uh, Hidalgo will say about him, he was a Catholic priest. And again, we'll say he led a popular revolt. Again, popular meaning of the people, so majority of the people, again, whereas Bolivar and others more representative of the Creole class. Uh, Hidalgo himself was executed. Leadership then passed to uh, Jose Maria Mor Morlos. He also was executed. And so at least for a very long time, uh, popular revolt was kind of uh, kept down, you might say, right? And more conservative royalist authority reigned supreme. Uh, eventually, one general, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this uh, name correctly, but Colonel Augustin de Iturbide, Iturbide, whatever it is, uh, he mobilized some popular protests in order to establish an independent Mexico in 1821. So technically, in 1821, Mexico broke free from Spanish rule, right? But here's the kicker, is that Turbide, right, 
uh, just made himself a monarchy. And so the original 1821 Mexico was a monarchical government. This was not acceptable for most of the people in uh, Mexico who at the very least wanted a constitutional government. Uh, Iturbide was executed as the first king of Mexico. And in 1824, Mexico established a republic that is a representative and constitutional government, right? So technically independent in 1821, free from Spanish rule, but really when we think about Mexico as a modern representative constitutional uh, enlightenment uh, state, it was in 1824 when that republic was established. Here you have a popular image. This is Hidalgo uh, leading the popular revolt, the popular masses. And you can get kind of a feel in this picture in the different ways that people are dressed. Here you have kind of a military figure that kind of looks like a Creole. These look like Creoles here. Uh, but then you have figures who look more like the Mestizo class, right, that are sort of littered within this and Hidalgo, the Catholic priest, being at the very center of it. Uh, one thing that was true about a lot of the Latin American revolutions was that they weren't as uh, anti-religious as perhaps some of the other revolutions elsewhere. The Catholic Church played a much more active role in, um, you know, in protesting against Spanish rule. Now we'll talk real quick about Brazil. Recall that Brazil is different in that it was a Portuguese colony. Pedro I, he was the Portuguese king. He fled to Brazil after Napoleon took over and ruled. And while he was there, he tried to get rid of slavery, right? He was opposed to slavery, but the Creole class was too powerful and instead forced him to abdicate in 1831. So to abdicate means to give up the throne. The Creole was too powerful. They were the slave owners, right? Brazil was a major center for African slavery, major center for sugar production. His son, Pedro II, pretty much ruled all the way into the late 1800s as effectively the monarch or king of Brazil. And by 1888, slavery was abolished, making Brazil the last Western hemisphere nation to abolish slavery. Right, last Western Hemisphere nation to abolish slavery uh, was Brazil.